Hi, I'm Commissioner Rob Gelder. Welcome to this episode of Commissioner's Corner. Today we're going to be learning all about the Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation and their process of restoring Fiddler's Dream, which is the boat behind me, as well as all of the different educational programs they will be bringing to the community. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Commissioner's Corner. Joining me now is Jonathan Thomas, who is the guy that we're going to interview today and talk all about the Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation. And the boat that we saw from a distance, we are now on it. So if you see us moving a little bit, it's because we're absorbing a little bit of wake. And if you hear a little sound in the background, we're in the Brownsville Marina and it's an active site. So uh, bear that in mind. And Jonathan, thanks, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this program today. Well, thank you for inviting us to participate in the Commissioner's Corner. So I'd like to, for the folks <laughs> watching the program, really want to have an opportunity to kind of dial it back. Uh, this has been a few years in the making of sort of where we are today. And obviously it's still a work in progress, right? It is. So tell us a little bit about how the Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation came to be and how Fiddler's Dream is now here being worked on. Okay, so a little bit of our history. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, we actually started running a tall ship um, that was said, here, go do with something with the schooner of Ingro. So we brought the schooner over to Brownsville and we started doing education programs and taking people sailing. Um, that was on a limited time loan, mm -hmm. so that schooner had to go back, and what we found is everybody wanted us to come to their marina, come to, to their festival, and we thought, wow, this is super. So in 2012, we formed uh, Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation, and we started looking at our own platform of vessel that we would own. Uh, the schooner Govingro had to go back to its owners in Seattle, so we started looking, and we realized that we wanted a vessel that was easy maintenance and but still had the traditional 1850s look so uh, lo and behold the fiddler's dream appeared in paul's boat the unfortunate part about the fiddler's dream she's a two-masted gaff rig schooner but she had been left sadly ignored at the dock for about four years mm. so when the vessel was donated to us we knew that um, with the, the lack of maintenance, we need to do some maintenance first before we started the education programs back on board this boat. So uh, January of 2014 is when the Fiddler's Dream was donated. We uh, uh, immediately started raising some money and we s said, um, well, if we do a little bit of maintenance here and there, we could do some things. Mm -hmm. But the board decided we need to do all the maintenance at once because our most precious cargo is our third, fourth, and fifth graders that are going to be attending our education program. Uh, so we opened this onion and we found everything that was wrong and we started now putting things back on. What's really neat is that uh, Olympic Resources mm -hmm. up in Paulsbo, they donated two trees to be our new masts. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we took those trees down to Aberdeen, had them turned into what I like to call 52-foot toothpicks, <laughs> and they're waiting in our spar barn that's about a mile away from here, waiting for us to get finished with the restoration. Um, now, so, do those have to be treated in some way or dried? Well, they're, they're drying right now. Okay. Um, they're they're well-seasoned. Uh, they went from three and a half foot diameter trees to nine inch, 52 foot sticks. Wow. And there's two of them. Uh, so we're very happy with uh, Olympic Resources and their donation from the Port Gamble. Actually, those trees came from the local Kitsap community. Sweet. So we'll have a nice tie to um, look at our new mass once we get them on board. Mm -hmm. So we brought the vessel here. <clears throat> Actually, we took it to Paul's boat to take the old mast off. Uh, and we came back here. Um, then uh, from there we went to Tacoma where we had uh, the vessel hauled out of the water. From the water line down we had it sandblasted as pure metal mm -hmm. and then we had it epoxy coated. We actually invited the Coast Guard in to do an inspection 
and they wanted us to do a little bit more work, so we did a, what's called an ultrasound, mm. and that way we found some welds that needed re-thickening. So we got all that work done. That was a big price tag. That was about $96,000 worth of work. Wow. But it's our foundation for our education program. True. The work that we had done won't need to be done ag again for 30, 40, maybe even 50 years maintaining the boat properly. The reason for the steel hull is because it's low in maintenance. If mm -hmm. it was a wood hull, um, if somebody donated $10,000 to the program, I'd have to tell them that 8000 would go towards the hull maintenance and 2000 would go towards the program. Where with a steel hull maintained properly, 2000 goes towards the whole boat maintenance and 8000 then can go towards yeah. our education programs. After that, we brought the boat back here and we put this wonderful marshmallow dome on it. <laughs> um, what that does for us is it gives us a controlled environment so mm -hmm. our volunteers can work in a nice, warm, not wet, not soggy environment. We then removed all the deck and replaced it with new decking. Um, this has been a very long process because every single piece of wood that you see on the boat right now has been produced in our shop up at the marina here. Wow. I mean, so they're, they're looking like sort of that traditional wood. I mean, so what goes in between the boards? So there's a process called corking. Okay. Each plank is laid down, mm -hmm. and then in between, there's cotton that's jammed in in between with a corking iron, and then on top of that, it's sealed, and then on top of that goes what's called a pitch. Um, we used a synthetic compound because the wood that we chose uh, to put on the deck is called apatong. It's very high in oils and resins, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the wood last a long time, but if we used the organic pitch, um, it would release from the wood. So we went with a synthetic sealant, and that's the black stripes that you see on the deck right now. So you basically restored the foundation of the boat, and now you've got the decking down. Yes. Sort of what's next? The next part is to go below decks. Mm -hmm. um, we had a 12,000 kilowatt generator donated to us to be our electrical source when we're out sailing. Um, we have bunks to put back in. We have an electrical system, and we're trying to go with as green as possible fittings using LEDs instead of mm -hmm. incandescent lights. Um, we're installing a new radar system, a new navigation and GPS system, um, but we'll also be installing a large screen TV for our marine biology station that will be an underwater camera so oh, the students can learn about that. Oh, so this is going to be basically an 1850s schooner that is high-tech. Yes. Okay. Um, to be exact, uh, the plans that this vessel was built to is from 1932. Okay. Uh, built, uh, designed by John Alden, which is a famous East Coast naval architect. And the interesting thing is all of his plans are stored in the Hart Nautical mm -hmm. Library at MIT. Oh, wow. So there's, there's great history in, in yes. connection with this. So yeah. was this boat built in the Northwest, or did it come here from the East? Or well, it was, we um, it was built in the Pacific Northwest, but okay. nowhere near the coast. The vessel was actually built in Missoula, Montana. Okay. A person um, wanted to go sailing, and he owned a loom manufacturing company. So he bought the plans and started building. Um, it's kind of an unfortunate story of uh, how they uh, lived on the boat for two years and then it changed hands. Mm. And from there, that person didn't know how to maintain it, didn't know really what he had, and so that's when he decided to donate it to us after we found it. Great. So in terms of the, the programming, obviously you were saying that it, it's great if uh, because of the steel hull it's less maintenance, so less of the fundraising, the, the monies that are donated to the, the program can be focused, most of it can be focused on the, the programs themselves and, yes. and that outreach to, to youth. So is the idea that you have uh, kids or like field trips come here to the marina or that you are getting out and about throughout Kitsap County or beyond? Good question. So because we're a floating vessel, we can move. And our whole program is designed around the fact that we can take the boat and go to Port Orchard mm -hmm. and we can have the third pre-schedule, the third, fourth, and fifth grades to come down and go through the four learning stations. 
It's an hour and a half long program. Mm -hmm. The first station that they go to is the history station. For a real quick history lesson is right across from where we are right now is Bainbridge Island. Mm -hmm. Do you know where Bainbridge Island got its name? That's a great question. A lot of people don't know. Uh, Bainbridge, where did that name come from? He was actually the fourth captain of the USS Constitution, That's the vessel that's floating in Boston Harbor right now. The oldest naval vessel is still in active duty history. Um, so William Bainbridge is where uh, Bainbridge Island got its name from. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of the many history lessons that we can teach. Uh, from the 1850s to the early 1900s, there was over 140 traditional vessels like this that were built right here in Kitsap County. Wow. And we're trying to get that word out and say, hey, look at this history that we have. And the, the ships here actually supplied the world with wood mm -hmm. and all other natural resources and fish. So um, with us celebrating that history, uh, and then the 1900s history of the Pacific Cod Fishing Company up in Paulsbo. Mm -hmm. A great amount of history there, which uh, almost started a war over the fishing grounds in Alaska. Uh, lots of good stories on oh, the history yes. side of things. So what other stations are there? Or you said there were four modules or yeah. four stations to the So train. we have the, the four stations are history. Mm -hmm. We have the mechanical advantage station that will be up on the bow. Okay. Uh, we have the, the navigation and charting station. And then we have the underwater camera marine biology. Uh, so from the history station, they'll move into the navigation and charting station. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways I can describe that is, have you ever ridden the Seattle ferry mm -hmm. from Bremerton to Seattle? Sure. So you know those red things that you always see the sea lions sleeping oh, on? Of course. Well, those aren't sea lion sleeping stations. <laughs> those are actually the markers for the roadway out there in the water. Mm -hmm. And just by being able to show that on a chart... And the students will learn that, oh, there's this old Navy saying called Red, Red Right Returning. Return. You know mm -hmm. that saying because you're a boater. And that gives them an understanding of why that red buoy is floating out there. It's mm -hmm. not just a sea lion's sleeping station. Mm -hmm. They'll also learn about true north versus magnetic north, since they're not exactly the same. Right. Uh, then they'll be able to, to also some learn some geology geography mm -hmm. with different names and the way the land is shaped. So from that station, they'll move down to the underwater camera station where we'll have a large green TV and they'll be able to see the feather dusters and the limpets and the barnacles. And then we'll switch to the other camera that will have a piece of chicken tied to it. Uh oh. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get some crabs crawling up to attack mm -hmm. the camera. That's always neat. Our idea is that they'll be able to take this video back to the classroom, mm -hmm. and with reference manuals, they'll be able to identify it. The other thing we also found with the marine biology station is if you're at your new house and you meet your neighbors and you meet Rex, their dog, if Rex gets out of the yard and he's running down the road, you now know his name, so you'll want to take care of Rex sure. if he gets away. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing if they learn uh, about limpets and barnacles and feather dusters. They'll know those names of those creatures at the dock mm -hmm. and at least cause them to be able to, to understand what they're doing and take care of them. So, so we a potential call that, cause and effect. Of... Well, we call that leading to stewardship. Mm -hmm. And the Puget Sound waters are in our front yard, as I like to call it. Right. Um, there's a lot to take care of here. Mm-hmm. So in, in terms of the navigation station, uh, do you get into sort of the reading of charts at all? We're going to be showing them how to measure distances okay. and why if you measure distance on one side of the chart versus the other side, because the world's round mm -hmm. and we're using a flat piece of paper, so we're only supposed to measure off of one side of the chart. And hopefully that will give an understanding of transferring from round to flat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's still people out there that think the world is flat, but that's a whole other story, <laughs> another program. Well, we're going to try and help them prove that wrong because we can take them sailing. Okay, perfect. So in terms of the underwater cameras, um, and you, you said there's two of them, so how do you actually get to that one camera to actually tie the chicken on it so to see if you can lure the crab in? It's a, it's a removable camera. We drop it over the side of the boat. Oh, okay. So it's, it won't be um, dangling underneath us at all So time. it's not actually within the hull of the boat? Correct. Okay, gotcha. And then the, the fourth station? The fourth station is the STEM station, or Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And 
because we're on this wonderful thing that has all these blocks and tackles or pulleys, if mm -hmm. you will, teaching students about how to make work easier, I think that's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. um, when we can use mechanical advantage to do work and teach them the math that goes with that, the block and tackle, whether it be a three to one or a four to one, it reduces the work you have to do to lift something up. Mm -hmm. There's a math formula that goes along with that. So just a simple understanding of how to make work easier can lead into, wow, this is neat. I want to I follow wanna that path. Study physics or, yes. or whatever the case may be. Now, do you have a process? Do you have different curriculum from based on the age groups? Or are you basically kind of focused on that grade three to five? We're focused on that grade three to five because that matches up with Washington State learning objectives. Okay. There's a little difference. Um, the math that a fifth grader learns is a little different than a fourth grader. The fourth graders are more into, or the third graders are more into experiencing their physical world, mm -hmm. where the fifth graders are into experiencing their physical world and learning why. Okay. So we do have a little bit of, of difference in the programs. Uh, the other program that we're looking at getting started is the, the culture of sailing and how when the European settlers came to visit here and who they interacted with with the, the native tribes. Uh, so we're looking forward to that being another program that we can get going. Very cool. So there's a lot going on in terms of the, the programming, the educational side of things. So getting back to the Fiddler's Dream mm -hmm. her, herself, I would imagine, um, is, I would imagine, volunteers are a big part of what makes it happen, the restoration move forward? Volunteers are a huge part. Uh, we currently have a paid shipwright that's guiding us in all of the work that we do. We have over 27 active volunteers. They can't come every weekend, so mm -hmm. they shift kind of weekends. Uh, our latest count with our volunteer hours is over 6,000 hours that we've been Fantastic. putting in. Yeah, uh, this, this deck replacement has been a big project mm -hmm. for us and it's taken a lot of learning for our volunteers to come up to speed. Um, wonderful though with our, uh, our shipwright that has been guiding us. Mm -hmm. One of the other volunteer type programs that we have is we're involved with Pathways to Success. Mm -hmm. It's a program here in Kitsap County through Olympic Services Educational District, or Olympic Educational Services, Services District, District mm -hmm. 114. They have a program called Pathways to Success. We hooked up with them about a year and a half ago. We have three of their interns, if you will. They actually pay them to come to us and learn worksite skills. Great. Really good story with that is one of our interns with Pathways to Success was accepted to the Job Corps program down at Tongue Point Astoria. He is now going through a two-year two program to get his merchant mariner's credential so he can actually work on the big working vessels. So pro Pathways program sounds good. Tell us a little bit about the program Reconnect with uh, JBLM. So uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord uh, has a program that we've called Reconnect, and it's for service members that are transitioning, and they want to kind of find out about their local community again because uh, where, where the places they've been deployed to. So we've agreed to have them come down once every three weeks on a Saturday. We usually have about 12 service members that come down, and they can work on the ship. Uh, they were actually here with us for the Brownsville Appreciation Days, where they were shining brass uh, portholes with us. <laughs> so they're very excited about being able to come down once every three weeks. Well, great, another excellent community program. Yes. So really, what's, what's next? What's coming up for um, the program? I, will this always be the slip for uh, Fiddler's Dream, or is it, there going to be something a little bit more visible? So our, our home port is right here at the Port of Brownsville. This okay. is where, uh, when, when the weekend's over with, this is where our home is. But what's nice is we can always go to Paul's Bow and do the programs, Bainbridge Island, South Kitsap, Seabec. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we're very mobile. Uh, one of the first things though that we need to do is get those new masts back on board. So we're spending the next few months trying to get everything that we need to, to get installed on the vessel. Um, we have to go through a Coast Guard mm -hmm. evaluation to make sure that we can sail properly and then they'll certify us for 
uh, up to a certain amount of passengers that we can take out sailing. So can you tell us a little bit about the timeline? So how, how much longer do you think it will take to uh, finish the restoration efforts? I, I really wish that I could t put a, a date of a stamp or stamp a date on there. Um, we're still in the fundraising mode. Uh, as we get funds, we do projects on the boat. So we're always raising funds. Um, right now, our current budget, uh, we need to raise $200,000 to okay. finish the restoration. Uh, we're, we're in the process with a Murdoch grant right now uh, that will hopefully will be selected for funding on that, and that's $100,000. And then we only need to raise $100,000 more. Uh, some people say that's a lot. Some people, uh, it's a, it's a, but it's attainable. I think it's, I think it's very doable when you think about the mission of the work and sort of the, that maritime connection to Kitsap County. And where we are so far. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a, a long, long distance to get us right here. But now that we have the deck on board, people can see the formation of the ship coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had all the money in the bank that we needed today, it would probably be about six to seven months before we would get this mass up and out sailing and certified by the Coast Guard. Okay. What aspects of the Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation and the project of restoring Fiddler's Dream have I not asked that our viewers just need to know about? Ah, uh, great question. So um, we're looking for volunteers always. Uh, we have an advisory committee. Mm -hmm. um, this is people that are out in the community that like the traditional vessels. Um, we meet once every three to four months. We have a meeting getting scheduled here for January. We're looking for folks from South Kitsap and North Kitsap to be to sit on the advisory committee. What they do is look at the programs and, and talk about what's happening. It's an hour-long meeting, and then they go back into their community and talk about us. Okay. Um, once programs are up and running, uh, then they can talk to their local schools or if they have grandkids, they can talk about how we're going to be funding the actual programs. So the volunteers that get involved with the restoration, I would imagine, you know, I'm not necessarily the best carpenter in the world. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can use a chop saw or something along that line, but I would think that maybe folks that might be interested in getting involved could feel a little intimidated. Oh, can, yes. can folks have pretty much any kind of skill set and, and be involved? One of the things we designed the program around was we know that we're not in Port Townsend. So we know that the folks that live here in our local community don't have the skills, whether it be sailing or carpentry skills, we're here to teach them. That's why we have the shipwright. Uh, a shipwright is a shipboard carpenter, mm -hmm. and he is a great guy. He has taught our volunteers so far everything, walked them through, taught. Uh, so no skills is not a problem because we're willing to teach. So I think that's a great point. When folks are looking for different ways to volunteer in the community to connect with programs and services, you don't always have to have the skill set, um, but there are often people there that are willing to show you um, how to do the job, and, and this is a great example of that. Yes, thank you. It is. Um, I can tell you that our volunteers that started with us and working with our shipwrights, they had no clue of the traditional decking that we've done. And now we have one of our volunteers that actually built a sample of how the deck was built. So we're really instilling some of those traditional wood shipboard woodworking skills. So talk to us a little bit about the, the shop that you have where you say a lot of the, the items, the wood has actually been manufactured there or crafted. Um, that's got to be a busy busy spot. It's a real busy spot. So we're located, our, our shop is located at what we call the old fire station here at the Port of Brownsville. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the man office or the man door with the office space and then we have the first garage door there at the old fire station. We're trying to rename the building Kitsap Maritimes building. <laughs> uh, but everything that is installed on the ship right now, wood-wise, has been manufactured in that, off or in that workspace. We have major tools that were donated to us. Mm -hmm. We had to purchase some, uh, but every single twist and angle that had to be cut into the wood was done up there, brought down to the boat, and installed. So it's a very time-consuming 
effort to do this. So how do you source the wood or the materials that you're using in the restoration? Well, we're very lucky with Edensaw up in Port Townsend. Uh, they bring in wood from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the deck beams that are supporting the deck is made out of Purple Heart. It's a South American hardwood, mm -hmm. and it's purple. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's marine plywood on top of those deck beams. Uh, we epoxy coated it to preserve it, to make sure if it got anywhere near water, which we're going to be on water, mm -hmm. uh, that it's protected. And then on top of that is when we put the deck planking. Uh, each deck plank was fitted before it was put in, uh, shaped as it needed, and then as it was installed, it was glued down with wow. a black, what we call 5200 3M glue. So uh, the deck on, that we're standing on will not leak at all. That's fantastic. So as much as effort as you went into is sort of restoring the foundation and making sure it was good, there's as, been as much, if not more, effort in making sure that the deck is good because it protects everything down, down yes. below. Yes. So I think that... Um, this is a great illustration of an organization and a group of people that have taken an idea from, in this case, the water line up <laughs> and have created a program that not only references and acknowledges the heritage of the maritime industry within Kitsap County, but also takes that and translates that into educational programs and really a way of making our past tangible for the future and sort of being able to apply that learning um, from here on out. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be part of the program today. Uh, I know that we just scratched the surface, so to speak, and uh, we'll have a website listed at the end of the program. If you want to learn more about the Kitsap Maritime Heritage Foundation and the work of the re restoration of Fiddler's Dream, you can check that out. They have a great Facebook page, and if you want to sort of like them and keep up on the, the posts and the updates or the events, you can definitely check that out. Jonathan, thank you again so much for Thanks being part for of it. Thanks for coming and visiting us Appreciate today. it. Thank you for watching this episode of Commissioner's Corner, Then I look forward to seeing you next time.